So uh, before I speak about virtual reality, I wanted to explain why I'm so interested in digital health. It really goes back, and I only understood this uh, as an adult, to my childhood. Because in one part of the family, there, um, there was an uncle who was an academic doctor, and the people who had access to him would get the best care. And on the other side of the family, which was where I was being raised, there were people with poor health and a lack of information, and their health was not as good. It, it was obvious to me, as a, even as a child, that we were in danger. And it, later on, I went to work in marketing of healthcare because I was interested in participating without being a scientist in some way in the improvement of health, perhaps because I had been impacted by that vulnerability in my own family. And when I discovered the web, which was 25 years ago this, this year, 1994, I realized that that would solve both giving access to people to information and to the better professionals to avoid the variability in care. And that's why, as, uh, uh, as Professor uh, Shafi Ahmed mentioned, that is why I was so interested in doing events, because I thought that the events would enable the physicians and everybody else to really get on board. And I discovered that didn't happen. And I've been wondering why we've so long been preaching to the convinced, preaching to the choir. And it's when I came across virtual reality that I understood the difference. It is because I believe, because virtual reality is therapeutic, it makes all the difference in the world. This excites phys physicians, nurses, anyone who treats patients. Because I believe that up until now, we were providing tools that would gather information in one place, but don't directly treat and give an impact to the patient. And so that is why physicians have been very frustrated by taking time away from the patient to participate in some sort of collective improvement of the system, but not individually seeing the results themselves. And time and again, when I talk about virtual reality, I see their interest rise. So what had happened up until now, sorry, electronic health records, it was the earliest. People started speaking about the interest of electronic health records over 50 years ago. And now we're still seeing the conflict that electronic health records contribute to burnout and to error, even though they might improve the situation, they also can contribute to error. Mathematically, this is about telemedicine, there is no way that each of you can live near all of the specialists who would be the most appropriate to take care of your case. So it should be a no-brainer that telemedicine should turn into a worldwide network where you would be hooked into everybody that you would need for your care. It hasn't happened because the system has resisted it. Medical websites started with a bang in 1996 with the National Library of Medicine making available all of those abstracts that it used to be impossible to access before that. A famous now billionaire, Jim Clark, led to the creation of WebMD. It was going to revolutionize Healthcare. This was one of the first big websites. Never happened, the revolution. We still have people saying that, still have some physicians saying that patients shouldn't consult the web. There are over 300,000 mobile health applications and very few that have a million or more downloads. Connected objects from head to toe, thousands, probably tens of thousands of options. And yet, when we asked for a raise of hands, nobody's physician had prescribed one to them. Artificial intelligence is promised a huge future, and even in the present, there are some great results. But it is born, I would say, in a bed of conflict 
as to whether it's going to replace people or not, whether ethically we can entrust a chatbot to do X, Y, or Z. So while artificial intelligence will move ahead, I believe it's not going to be without some rocks on the path. And then we get to virtual reality, which I believe is totally different. If you were wearing your headset, you would now really think that you're at the top of this uh, building on the rope bridge about to go across. You can really feel that you are in the situation when you wear the headsets. And there are amazing results. There was a publication in The Lancet showing, I found this particular result amazing for fear of heights. I'm sure if I put together all of the kinds of fears that there are and anxiety and depressiveness, that you would all want to benefit from virtual reality as we will see through these different examples. So after an average of five sessions for a total of two hours, do you think that virtual reality did as well as a face-to-face -face session? It in fact did better. And for someone who was uh, uh, giving a testimonial, they went to a shopping center this is a quote from a patient. After three sessions, they were able to look all the way down the several floors, and there was no problem. Fear of spiders, rodents, heights, any sort of fear can be treated. Parkinson's, so we have a person here, um, Mike Eagles, who uh, has Parkinson's. I, I so happened that I came from the airport in the same car with him and asked him if he tried virtual reality. He said yes, and it did have some impact for him. I don't know if we will hear this. If we don't, I'll just say what it is. Is there sound? So anyway, this is a study that has shown that Parkinson's patients will improve their balance. After 30 days of 30 minutes a day, of being put into a, a situation like this. So improving balance in Parkinson's with virtual reality being directly therapeutic. This is for eye rehab rehabilitation. If we were to ask you to do a certain number of minutes every day of uh, rehabilitation, whether it's for your eye or something else, you would probably not be able to count whether you've done it. With this, it's fun and we know that you're getting the results because we can see the improvement through the program. This person uh, was in, uh, in a battle and has wounds and taking care of the wounds is very painful. If we were to hear this sound, which I guess we oh, won't. Really oh, we do, okay. A little bit louder? When it happened and then after, when I went down there and I knew what happened, then I tried And the you will VR be seeing what he sees instantly it was so in much his better. headset I, I when he's wearing take, it. I was like an Ativan. Basically, they had to give me a, a little bit of anti-anxiety drugs and then just my regular painkillers and I was able to sit and go through it very easily, right? It so totally he explains that the, the nurse the can work on his wounds um, because he is watching this. It. He is also distracted. Went by really fast, right? You can feel it, right? Like I can feel them pulling and things like that, but it's, it's as soon as, as soon as. And uh, you've of course seen friends, so you remember that Rachel gave birth. So many of you would not imagine that one could propose to a woman who's about to give birth to use virtual reality instead of having a, an anesthetic uh, injection. Well, it has demonstrated significant reduction of sensory pain, cognitive pain, and anxiety. And I was fortunate enough at a conference that we both went to, to, to moderate a panel with patients, and you will hear a woman whose doctor had proposed this, because it was the second birth, and she was not happy with the first birth a couple of years before, because the child remained groggy uh, from the anesthetic that she had taken. And I used the apparatus for probably about two hours, and I really did not feel that I wore. So she said she was taking. I think it's not loud hours. enough. She was taking it for and two hours, 
and during at, that time, the doctor came like, up to her and said, it's over. My doctor came over to take the apparatus off me. I'm like, what are you doing? He's like, you're ready. Like, you're going to push your baby out. For and her, it was a few minutes, minutes. I delivered my baby. She delivered her and baby. One of the things that I was so surprised about was when I delivered her, immediately I was able to connect with her. She, I breastfed immediately. There was no none of that, um, like, she wasn't, she wasn't drugged, <laughs> so I had a very successful experience using VR. And in fact, the guy sitting next to her had uh, severe pain from um, uh, colon uh, disease, and he was able to get out of addiction to opioids using virtual reality. This is a very new concept within the world of virtual reality. It's about disembodiment. So we can see here that you have, for example, on the bottom left, two people who look to be speaking. But in fact, when you wear the headset, you can believe that you are speaking to another person through which you will channel your own thoughts. They will come back to you and convince you that you should do this good advice that you're giving yourself as, for example, to go forward and live and not be depressed. Uh, as to uh, not be afraid of something, as to not be anxious. So disembodiment has been more recently discovered as a new aspect that can be extraordinarily therapeutic for someone without having to seek out a therapist who would tell them what they already know but they just can't understand. This woman, you can see she's suddenly been happily surprised. She has dementia, from, uh, which leads to lack of memory and lack of memory leading to dementia. And through the headset, she has seen the house she used to live in. And this projected her into the time that she used to uh, be there. And she suddenly was able to converse, where she had lost the ability to discuss. And I believe you saw this uh, earlier today in Daniel Crafts. This is in an old age home. To respond to the query one would have, well, can elderly people get along with virtual reality? And in fact, they can. So this is another great option. It can be used to get them over anxiety, depression, and also to relearn how to navigate, how to walk around the neighborhood. You can explain to them the rooms in the house, the streets around the building. All of this has been uh, demonstrated. And when I've seen this presented in rooms of clinical professionals, they get very excited. I was fortunate on Monday night to be able to make another presentation locally, and there was a Bulgarian woman that's already written to me that she wants to get involved in virtual reality. And she's a pediatric oncologist thinking of all it can do for children. Greece is very close to Bulgaria, so you probably know that that word on the left means touch. The reason I bring up touch or haptikos is the future of virtual reality is to be able to transmit to you from head to toe all forms of sensors from a distance through the headset and the software and different tools that you will use. So while we've already discovered so many fascinating things, I believe that virtual re reality has even a brighter future with haptics. And I'd love to talk about it to anybody after the uh, program. And I'm exactly on time. <laughs>